And now, your local 23 forecast first. In the local 23 Weather Center, I'm Chief Meteorologist Robert Bettis. We knew it was going to be a warm work week, and look at that. 91 today in McAllen, 89 Edinburgh, and 87 in Brownsville. We had some little isolated showers move through the RGV tonight, but those showers have tapered off. Tomorrow, we may see a drop or two. Nothing major there. But late on Thursday, after a very hot afternoon, here come the thunder showers with another cold front. I'm going to have your detailed forecast. Local 23 News starts right now. Coming up, local and state election results are coming in. A look at some of the mayoral races and state propositions. Plus, the mother of a teen accused of murder blaming a Valley District Attorney for the death of a Rio Grande City teen. Plus, her smile touched the hearts of many. The honorary Harlingen Police Chief loses her battle to cancer. Tonight, unofficial results are coming in for Election Day. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brenda Medina. We'll get to those in just a bit, but first to our top story. An arrest warrant out tonight for a man wanted in connection with the murder of a missing couple. Local, state, and federal authorities on the hunt for the murder suspect believed to be across our border. The New Hampshire couple found dead on Padre Island in a shallow grave. We first told you about this investigation Monday night after the couple's RV and truck were captured, being driven across Mexico by an unknown man. Tonight, Clayburg authorities identifying that man as 33-year-old Adam Curtis Williams, who is considered armed and dangerous. Williams is wanted on felony theft charges. Amanda Nover, the woman believed to be in the truck, remains a person of interest in this case. Uh, we ask that people not approach these individuals, but simply uh, that we ask if you have had some contact, that you please come forward. Investigators believe both Williams and Nover are in Mexico and are working with Mexican authorities to locate them. Anyone with information on their whereabouts are urged to call the Clayburg Sheriff's Office. That's the number that's on your screen. That's 361-595-8500. The fear of corruption in local law enforcement is what a mother is alleging led to the death of a Rio Grande City teen. A tense afternoon in the courtroom after Jose Luis Garcia Jr.'s mother looked at Stark County's District Attorney Omar Escobar in the eyes, accusing him of working with criminals. The mother of the teen accused of orchestrating the death of Chase Olivares now saying she fears for her life. Our Joanna Guzman has the latest. Joanna? Presumption of innocence does not exist in Stark County, depending on how well you know prosecutors. That is exactly what Jose Luis Garcia Jr.'s mother told the jury during her son's trial, who is accused of shooting 17-year-old Chase Olivares, then paying someone to chop up and burn his body. Defense attorney called on Garcia's uncle, mother, and a school counselor to testify after the state rested its case. Garcia's mother, Sandy Garcia, testified her and her family fear the Olivareses because they are known to be the bad people in town, adding Olivares pointed a gun at her son's head threatening to kill the entire family if he complained about a drug dispute the two allegedly had. She also spoke about a text message Garcia reportedly received on his birthday from Olivares and although the content of that message was not revealed to the jury, Garcia says she felt her family's life was in danger and went on talking about Olivares' father allegedly being investigated for the execution of two women employees at Rio Grande City CISD who were found naked and tied up together with gunshot wounds to their heads in 2016. During testimony, Garcia repeatedly voiced her fear about testifying, stating she feels there will be repercussions from Stark County law enforcement and the Olivareses, who say who she says are both dangerous people. She accused Stark County police of being associated with the Olivareses after Olivares' dad showed up to the Roma ranch where Olivares' remains were found while investigators were interviewing Garcia. Garcia's mother claims nobody else could have given Olivares that information besides law enforcement, arguing she had not been notified her son was arrested. When Garcia's mother was asked why she didn't report the alleged threats from Olivares towards her son to police, she openly accused the Stark County's DA, Omar Escobar, of corruption, claiming A would have done her family more harm than good. A school counselor also took the stand testifying Garcia was smarter than the average student and was a great kid, but prosecutors argued having good grades did not mean he was not capable of killing someone. In the McAllen Newsroom, I'm Joanna Guzman, Local 23 News. All right, Joanna, thank you. Three other suspects have been charged in connection to this homicide. 
And he's being called the teenage terrorist because he threatened to bomb religious sites. And tomorrow he's said to be in two courtrooms. 18-year-old Joel Hayden Shimsher is said to be in the 197 state court and in federal court. The charges in both courts all stem from a terroristic threats he allegedly made on Twitter. District Attorney Louis Sainz, Harlingen Police, and now the federal prosecutors say that Shremsher had the means and motive based on what was discovered in his bedroom. That's where Harlingen PD reportedly found white supremacist literature, newspaper clippings of the Oklahoma City bombings, along with explosive component and chemicals. In chemicals, he's being held on a $1 million bond. McAllen Police needs your help locating a 17-year-old Jacob Edward Lopez. He's wanted for aggravated assault, a second-degree felony. Lopez is described as a Hispanic male, about 6 feet in height, 170 pounds, black hair, brown eyes. Authorities say that Lopez discharged a weapon, injuring two people. They were then taken to a hospital, treated, and are said to be doing good tonight. A warrant has been issued for his arrest. If you have any information on his whereabouts, you're urged to call the McAllen Crime Stoppers at 956-687-TIPS. Now to the latest election results for some of the 10 proposed Texas propositions on the ballot. We begin with proposition number two, which would allow the issuance of bonds to the Texas Water Development Board. Those bonds would not exceed more than 200 million and would be used to provide financial assistance for the development of projects in economically distressed areas. Board is approving Prop 2 so far by a vote of 63%, 4 and 36% against. Proposition 4, one of the most talked about amendments on the ballot, dealing with a state income tax, prohibiting an individual income tax, making it much harder to remove the ban in the future. With 87% of counties reporting, voters approving Prop 4, 77% to 22%. In Proposition 5, dealing with sales tax revenues generated from the sale of sporting goods in the state. Voters approving Prop 5 by a vote of 86, 4, and 13 against. The amendment would allow existing taxes already dedicated from sporting good revenues to be given to the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department as well as the Texas Historical Commission. The current law allows lawmakers to use those funds for other purposes. Dealing with billions of dollars in funds for cancer research, Proposition 6 would increase maximum bonds by $3 billion for Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas. Voters approving Prop 6 by a vote of 63% for and 36% against. Proposition 7 would allow an increase of distribution of $300 million to the available school fund. It would also allow some state agencies the ability to manage revenues from land and other properties in the permanent school fund and distribute them. Voters approving Prop 7 by a vote of 73% for and 26% against. Proposition 8 deals with funding for flood infrastructure. The amendment would allow for the creation of a flood infrastructure fund. Now, those funds would then be used to assist financing of drainage and flood control projects. Voters are approving Prop 8 by 76% to 23%. And Proposition 10 catered towards the caretakers for retired law enforcement canines. The amendment would allow the transfer of retired law enforcement animals to a private person, organization, or qualified caretaker in certain circumstances at no cost. Orders approving Prop 10 by a vote of 93% for and 6% against. And in addition to the 10 constitutional amendments on tonight's ballots, several cities in Hidalgo County holding city elections. Our Mike Jimenez joins us from our McAllen studios with those results. Mike? Good evening, Brenda. Hidalgo County voters and four municipalities headed to the polls today to elect a mayor. Let's take a look at those results. In the city of Alamo, two-time incumbent Mayor Diana Martinez holding a comfortable lead over challenger of place one, Alamo City Commissioner Trinidad Trino Medina, 54% to 45, with 43% of the precincts reporting. In the city of Ed Couch, incumbent Mayor Virginio Virgil Gonzalez Jr. holding off a challenge from Alderman Fred Borrego Jr. With just early voting numbers in so far, Gonzalez is winning 54% to 45. In the city of La Jolla, with 40% of precincts reporting, and battle mayor Fito Salinas 
losing a challenge from former police chief Isidro Casanova, while Jaime Gaitan is a distant third. And over in Westlaco, incumbent mayor David Swat is getting a big win over challenger Alfredo Duff Castaneda, taking 72% of the vote, with nearly 48% of precincts reporting. For more election results, you can visit us at KVO.com or on social media. In our McAllen newsroom, I'm Mike Jimenez for KVO Local 23 News. All right, Mike, thank you. The Trump administration has been fighting to undo the rules that dictate how U.S. immigration treats migrant children who enter the country illegally. Those rules were established by a court agreement called the Florida Settlement. Our Washington correspondent, Alexander Limon, reports the administration is employing a new strategy. The executive director of Amnesty International USA, Margaret Wong, says that during a visit to the border a couple of weeks ago, the director of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, Jonathan Hayes, unexpectedly flew to the border to meet the humanitarian delegation. He believes that the Flores rules and regulations don't apply to ORR shelters. The director of the Office of Refugee Resettlement reportedly told Amnesty International that ORR does not run detention centers. That's why he believes the rules don't apply to his agency. It might be a better detention than what CBP offers or what ICE offers, but they don't have a choice. But in a statement responding to my questions, the Department of Health and Human Services said that Amnesty International got it wrong. HHS says the Flores settlement does apply, but HHS says it believes the settlement does not specify a 20-day rule for holding migrant children. The statement also said certain Flores rules do not apply to providers housing unaccompanied migrant children. Well, it's been a top objective of the, of the administration to say they should not be bound by any rules guiding the humane treatment of children. Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon says the rules set by the Flores settlement require appropriate nutrition, medical care, and living conditions for all migrant children. Why would anything but a very evil administration oppose these basics for the humane treatment of children? Legal challenges continue on exactly what the Flores settlement requires. In Washington, Alexandra Limon.